pretty cool. But God, they have the presence of God. Joshua is their leader at this point. Joshua is certainly filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, we're going to go and we're going to take that city. <laughs> Look at this city. And it's got walls. They're, they're high. You're not going to go up and climb over these walls and take the city. And God says, go take that city. And they said, okay, what do you want us to do? March around it one time, first day. Second day, march around it again. On the seventh day, he says, march around seven times. <laughs> okay, so they're marching. Now, can you imagine the people up on the wall? They're standing there, and they're looking at these crazy Israelites marching around their city. And God says, on the seventh time, I want you to stop and blow your horns and yell the... Uh, the there's a horn. There's the name of the horn. Deborah, you know the name of that horn? A shofar. The name of that, that horn is the horn they use to, to call the presence of God. And they blow that horn. And these walls fall down. That's the same with us. If we have the presence of God, we're going to seek the works of God because if we seek the works of God, all we got to do is go out and pick up the blessing. If you're seeking the works of God, we go out and we pick up the blessing. I think that is the most incredible good news that I've heard ever. That we seek the works of God. God's works were finished from where? From the foundation of the world. Thanks, Deborah. You know, it says, uh, I used to spout this out all the time, but I'm, just, I'm going to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll start with uh, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9 says, Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And it says, For we are His workmanship. Who's, who's His? God. Christ, God. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. And this is it, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now if you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 4, and that's in verse, and this really, it says uh, in the second part of that, I'll read it all. For we who have believed do not enter rest as he has said. That we do not enter that rest as he has said. Does anybody know the rest that God's talking about? The rest that God's talking about, and, and they, they say, I've heard people argue that this is why we don't keep the Sabbath because it says in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done. He rested on the Sabbath day on all his, from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the Sabbath day, sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. They said that was God's rest. Nothing to do with man's rest. That is the argument that, that they make. It has nothing to do with man's rest. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 4, it tells you we are to enter into God's rest. And what, when is God's rest? He tells us back in Genesis chapter 2. So it's not just in the, the uh, commandment. It's not... Yeah. Right. It's not in just a commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Anyway, that's free. I, I wasn't going to say all that. There's no charge for that. But anyway, so we want, whose works do we want? We want God's works. And like I said, if we have God's works, all we have to do, we got to pray that God will give us His works. And we go out and we pick up the blessing. That sounds kind of lazy like. 
But God's going to use us. He is, he's going to, his motivation will come on us. We can't help it. We all love the Lord. We want to do something. We're all sitting here. We don't know what to do. Do we go knock on doors? Does God tell you to go knock on the door? Yeah, I think we better go knock on the door. But God has not said, Ricky, go knock on the door. But if he does, I'm going to knock on the door. Your neighbor is your is your uh, mission field. The people you work with are your mission field. The people you deal with in your neighborhood, everywhere. The, the grocery store, the hardware store. We take the gospel to the world, not in our words, but in our deeds and our actions and everything that we do. How we look at somebody. How we cut, if, if somebody cuts us off, do we give them the nice Hawaiian hello sign or do we, God bless, you bless them. Uh, oh, let's see, where am I going? Good preachers don't say that. <laughs> and I want us to remember, it's not about heaven. I hear people tell all the time, I can't wait to get to heaven. If God ain't there, if Jesus Christ is not in heaven, I do not want to go to heaven. If Jesus is not in heaven, I don't want to go. I want to be where Jesus is. I don't care where He is. If you see... What God has done for us. Do animals say thank you when you give them a treat? They just gobble it up, man. And they're like, oh, give me another one, give me another one. No, oh, oh. they don't know how to say thank you. When you watch in third world countries, they have some films, and you see them giving out food sometimes, and, and it'll break your heart. They grab the food, they run over, and you know, they go and they, and they I'm sorry, never. They grab the food, they go down, and, they, and they, they have no idea of thanks. They, they don't say, because that, they don't, don't, they're not being mean, they just don't understand. Because they're looking at you, like you got all this food, you're rich, you're a millionaire. And it doesn't cost you nothing. To give me this little morsel you just gave me, it cost you nothing. If a billionaire came up to you and handed you a dime, would you be thankful? You'd be like, are you kidding me? You've got a billion dollars and you just handed me a dime. <clears throat> the truth is that it is impossible for anyone, a Christian or a heathen, to feel thanksgiving unless he has some appreciation of what it costs the giver. Think about that. Think about what it cost Christ. We think that he just popped in Mary's belly and came out and he went back to heaven after he was crucified. Whoopee. That's what we look at. We think, and I don't mean to downplay the crucifixion and all that. But he gave up heaven. He put his eternal existence on the line. People hate to hear what I'm fixing to say, that he could have failed. If it wasn't possible for him to fail, he could, he could just say, uh, he could just fix everything. You know, just boom, just fix it. You know, it's like when people say, well, why didn't God just kill Lucifer? Well, if he just killed Lucifer, the rest of creation would serve God out of fear. God does not want him to serve anybody except because they love him. Amen. I believe God does not want a heaven without free will. I think God would not want to be in existence without free will. That is a strange thing to say. But God is so humble that He does not direct you to say, you're going to do that. God does not whip us. God draws us. So back to the story about um, 
you know, our, our, our spiritual problem is we don't realize what it costs God to come to this earth. And the only way we're going to understand how God, what God did, is right here. Right here. Now, I suggest that you not only read the Bible, but you read the Spirit of Prophecy, especially uh, the Desire of Ages, where Jesus is contemplating the cross and the stories. There, I can't remember the stories. Maybe somebody knows the chapters. But if you read those couple of stories where Jesus is con contemplating the cross and he's looking up ahead of, uh, at, at being hung naked in front of everybody, uh, but what people don't people don't see you don't see it in the, in the movies. The biggest thing to Christ was the separation it was going to cause between him and his father. The sin he paid for would separate you and me from the father. What the wages of sin is death. And it's all of sin that falls short of the glory of God. So we all are contaminated. The further we get off in sin, the further we get away from God, the worse we are. God still loves us. And He has promised to take every sin, no matter how bad it is. There's been very few things on this planet that have shown the love of God. And I want to tell one short little story, and then I want to, I want to close. Uh, actually, there's a couple, but I, I got so many stories. I'm not a good storyteller either, but they're right here and there, and they have changed my life. There's a woman, I can't remember what country she's from, probably the Middle East, and she has had acid dumped in her, on her face. She's burned. She's unrec. She's recognizable. You can tell she's a woman, but she's just, just burned. And they catch the person that does it. Well, in the society that they live in, she's allowed to take a bucket of acid and throw it on him. You know, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And they bring the guy to her, and I think she must be blind because they, she asks, is he in the room? And they say, yes, he's in the room. And she says, my God, Jesus has forgiven me I am not going to hold this sin against you. Let the man go. I mean, that's only a sample of what Christ has done for the human race. The woman letting the man go. I mean, he is, Jesus has taken everything. You know, there are better stories than I'm telling that what Jesus has done for the human race. It's, it's incredible. I When we are truly seeking God, and we're truly to seeking to do God's will, the Holy Spirit takes the precepts of His words and makes them the principles of life, writing them on the tablets of the soul. You have got to read God's word. God is not going to, uh, you're not going to get to heaven if you have opportunity to read God's Word and you're not reading it. There are people that don't have opportunity to read God's Word that will be in heaven because they're living up to it, all the light that they have. But why would you want to not read it? Because the, the Spirit of Prophecy says that heaven begins here and now. We don't have to fear death. That is one of the biggest things that's going on in society now is the fear of death. And I want you to put this in your mind and let it go deep into your mind. When you die, the next second, it'll seem like the next second, you'll see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. And he's going to be saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. I can't imagine a better line or a better thing coming said being said to me than well done my good faithful servant. We don't want to hear those words depart from me, I never knew you.
the closer you get to Jesus, the more you're going to feel His presence. And that's the name of my sermon, the presence of God. We want to practice <coughs> excuse me, the presence of God. There is just a couple more things that I would like to bring out. Uh, very quickly. You know, God doesn't deal with us according to our sins. And we have to remember that if He dealt with us according to our sins, we would be wiped off this planet. Amen. He would start over. He would, he would have said, Adam, you failed. <laughs> start over. But He loves us so much. And this is what He's saying to us. For us to love each other the way He loves us. To love your enemies. It's easy for me to love somebody that, you know, my household, even if I'm mad at them, I can still, you know, I get over it. I love them again. But God takes us to the next level. Love your enemies. You look, you read the Bible, and you see what how Jesus treated his betrayer, Judas. Loved him. And he even asked, the last thing he said to Judas, he says, Friend, you betrayed me with a kiss? Is our everything. Amen. And as Paul said, to save his brothers, he said, Take my life, take my soul, take my everlasting life, and give it to my brothers. Put me in the lake of fire, burn me up, out of existence. Paul said that. Moses said that. And we have got to remember that Jesus said, I am risking my eternal existence on this sin experiment. That is an incredible, incredible thing. Take that, take that as, as, uh, as gas in your tank. That Jesus paid it all. All to him I offer. Oh, sin has left a crimson stain. But Jesus washed it twice. Closing song is number 529.